This piece is in three movements. We're only showing two tonight because it's not finished. And it is emerging. Judith is emerging. What we're trying to do is listen to the piece that wants to be made and wants to be born. This Anglo-Saxon epic uh, in modern English and Anglo-Saxon. So let's see what we think about that. Yenam tha thona hathanan manan. Let's all do it. Yenam tha thona hathanan manan. So hathanan will become heathen, yeah. right, oh, in modern yeah. English. Yeah. And that, that A-E ligature um, yeah. is called an ash, and it's a really strong ah sound. Ah. Um, ah. So, ah. Yeah, my, my, my ah, professor ah. Chick Chickering and always used to say like, quack, 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 stay with, stay with me in Duckland, people. <laughs> so, uh, so quack, like if you, see, if you have any quacks, um, uh, quack, quack will become what, quare will become where in modern English. Um, it sounds sort of like what it's it is, is, having done so much Shakespeare and realizing that when the characters in Shakespeare speak their hearts, their minds, their their guts. Gut. <laughs> they are on the ground of the English language. They speak monosyllabically. And so, you know, sort of always. I've worked with Karen for a couple of Shakespeare productions, and she loved that's an Anglo Saxon word. <laughs> and, bring, and, and, and it's, it, it means a lot to her to point that out when, when, when Shakespeare uses that. Right. Yeah, we were talking with the students last Friday about from Macbeth, the famous line, the multitudinous seas <laughs> incarnadine, both. Latinate complex words, and then making the green one red, and, and how he puts them right next to each other, sort of the bang it to you that he's bringing those together. It's oftentimes an Anglo-Saxon word that is the nasta dad tha yit. Nasta dad tha yit. He was yeah. He was not dead yet. <laughs> And make that funny, because it, it is funny. <laughs> like, the, it's the Monty Python. Not, not yet, right? <laughs> That's great, because the bard is going to have this sense of, of he's the interlocutor for the audience, mm -hmm. so there's that sense of being funny and knowing a lot and playing and, with the modern and the ancient. You're almost un taking away the layers of what becomes the subsequent power structure, right? The Norman conquest and that Latinate. Um, mm -hmm. dominance over the Anglo-Saxon, which fits with the Judas story, right, of being the heroine um, from the Hebrew people against What's... the dominant Assyrians. All the fairness, say burn with a burn with a break, or... Can you say that one more time, please? Sorry. Uh, that, that him that have or want. That, that him, him that, that have, have or want. Yeah. Fourth on the floor. That's the easiest one. Oh. Yes. Fourth on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> it really translate. I got that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know, that's the one I keep saying. <laughs> <laughs> Fourth on the floor. What I'm noticing, and the hardest part, is letting the natural rhythm of the text sing. Like, there are ways in which it has a punctu- you know, it has a metric quality to it. If you wanted to, like, splice lines and do multigat mendigo, stroto and yadada, yeah. then your rhythm comes. Yeah, let's do that. Stroto and yadada, drunko mansiva, drenche me bleed, and third time, oh, crazy. And the final D is a T? Final D is, is probably like a, a T German. after wow. it, just like in German. Hund. Um, Hund, Hund, yeah. I mean, if you want to say Hund, I mean, there are no living Anglo-Saxons who are going to, like, come after you. <laughs> <laughs> no one's composed in Anglo-Saxon. I think the language is so delicious. I mean, I, five, five years ago, I, I didn't speak a word. Now I'm, I'm hailing kings and <laughs> And, and, and loving it, and loving Judith's prayer, the sound is just amazing. Frofregast, Verl Awalden, 
wie den Wille, mit innere, mit Arfendra, frühnes Frim. If you can give us that double D in Biddan, sure. that would be great. Done. Good models. We have amazing models of opera and of, of creative work. And so, the question that I, I'm asking and that we're asking is, what can we make that is uniquely ours and uniquely the vision that we have and the sounds that we have? And um, it, the, I think the biggest hurdle to get over, at least for me in writing the music, is we have Benjamin Britten, we have Igor Stravinsky, we've got Thomas Addis, we've got all these wonderful people who have written great, great work. And what? I mean, I'm going to write an opera. <laughs> I think that for me was the biggest hurdle was just actually believing that I could yeah, make yeah, something yeah. that could be that long yeah. or that have that big of a arc. You can write a choral piece, you can write a piano piece, but to write a long extended work takes, it just takes an incredible amount of discipline in my experience. And also willingness to say, mm, no, that wasn't great, try again. We will not die. Feel free like, to, take it, to take that into yourself and make it your, you're really talking to her and you're really, you're repeating her exact words and make turning it into a question. Just yesterday, we we're changing a line because the characters needs to speak differently, and, and that's been the fun thing for me is, is noticing that these characters are coming alive in our presence and in our conversation, and yeah. then in the people who are actually fleshing them, and they're talk they're talking to us, and we're, we're learning about them, and we're learning what they might say or actually what they might not say, uh, and that's powerful. This yeah. this is a powerful time for discovery. Are, is this all Pocanto, or is, is there going to be any down the ever? I mean, I feel like I feel like honestly, I'm ready to hand it over to over to you at this moment because okay. there's no reason. We're always told that artists have a lot of ego, but honestly, you have to kill your darlings over and over and over again when you create a piece. Because you know, I come to them and say, "Well, this really doesn't make sense to me. Or this doesn't work." Or like, you know, that is really awkwardly written for my voice. Can we, you know, adjust? Can we flesh it out? Judith wouldn't say this here, you know, and they have been so amenable and open and collaborative. And as an artist, that's so nice. Oftentimes singers are on the bottom of the totem pole, <laughs> in, in the opera world especially. But we are artists too and have just as many thoughts and we're just not always allowed to speak them aloud. So this has been a, a treat for me to get to be part of the creation of Judith. Trini is doing the work of the bard. It's, it's kind of, but it's almost like akin to cantillation or cantering, or it has a kind of mysterious quality like that, where it's sort of summoning forth, it feels like it's summoning forth something yeah. holy. Yes. Um, and yet he's also kind of a, a fun, playful body character, too, who's well, noticing other things. <laughs> that character, right, is totally made up. The bard is sort of Tiresias, a sort of pop, uh, Ariel, all of The elders were blown away. By the woman's boldness. <laughs> that character who can go into the future, into the past, and, and have humor, you know, to connect, to, to twist, to spin, but in a way that's implicating an audience. What wonder in the words of the woman? I did not want to go on into the seductive Judith. It didn't interest me. We've seen that so many times. Rather, the, more the truth to power. Something can be done. A Hebrew woman comes to speak with you. A woman. A woman is the perfect person for doing it. <laughs> I joke a lot with Paul and Karen, about, and I'm, I'm a very opinionated person, and they are very patient with me. Judith, oh Judith. There is nothing to be done but pray and wait. There is nothing to be done. In sleep, you are king. Each 
she has blood in her hands, even though that was the thing that she had to do. She prays to do it. She was about to be raped. She had to save her people, and so she makes that action. There's a rabbinical commentary that talks about when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, God permitted the Israelites to rejoice in the killing of the Egyptians, but God forbade the angels to rejoice. And it's that kind of living with that interesting, weird tension, the, 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 yeah. the sacredness of life, and yet also justice, or the need for something that feels like it, it honors this, the ache of the human soul, the oppressed soul. The tone of humor and the passing of the light, the sacred, and the responsibility. Trying to really find what that is. I mean, yeah. it's still percolating and finding it. There's this sort of tight road to walk. And it's, it goes one direction and pulls back sometimes between the modern and the archaic. And that's been very fluid in the various scenes. It's to find the tone of that question and also the humor of the poem. So I don't know, we're still finding it.